Hello dear students, so I am back with one more lecture on William Shakespeare's Macbeth and in this lecture we will be concerning ourselves with Act 5 Scene 2 onwards. So let's go into the text without further ado. The country near Dunsinane is the site. And we have already seen how the witches have prophesied that uh, Macbeth shall not need to worry until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane. So here we meet some new soldiers whose names are Mendeth, Katniss, along with the old Angus and Lennox and other soldiers. So Mendeth begins the scene by saying, the English power is near, led on by Malcolm, his uncle Seward, and the good Macduff. Now, when he says the good Macduff, we know that they belong to the party of the uh, just Malcolm and uh, the party which is trying to get back Duncan's throne. Revengers burn in them for their dear causes good. To the bleeding and the grim alarm excite the mortified man. So according to Katniss, uh, according to Menteth, the just cause of Malcolm would burn the fire of revenge even in the dead people. Near Burnham Wood shall we meet them, that way are they coming. So they shall parley at Burnham Wood, they shall meet at Burnham Wood. And we can already see that the prophecy is about to come true. Who knows if Donald Bain be with his brother? For certain, sir, he is not. I have a file of all the gentry. There is Seward's son and many unruff youths that even now protest their first of manhood. Now, over here, the word protest means proclaim. That is, Lennox has a list of the warriors who are about to fight Macbeth. And he says that there are many young men who are about to proclaim their own metal in this battle. What does the tyrant, the reference is to Macbeth, great dancing and he strongly fortifies. Some say he is mad, others that lesser hate him do call it valiant fury. But for certain he cannot buckle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. This is a very interesting way of putting it. That is, this phrase suggests that the entire country of Scotland is in a diseased condition. Or it perhaps suggests that Macbeth is drooping with a disease which is called dropsy. Dropsy means a kind of disease which, which comes with a gorged belly, a gorged stomach. Uh, protruded stomach. So just like with a protruded stomach, you cannot put up your pants and uh, put your belts on. Similarly, as if Macbeth cannot hold the country together anymore. Now does he feel his secret murders sticking on his hands? Now minutely revolts, upbraid his faith breach. Those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. Now does he feel his title hang loose about him, like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. So look, Macbeth had already said in the beginning, why do you dress me in borrowed robes? And now does he realize that he is a pygmy wearing a giant's clothes. Now everybody realizes that, that Macbeth is unsuited for his office. And it is this discrepancy in Macbeth's appearance and his reality that is being shown over here, that is being proclaimed over here. Mentet says, who then shall blame his pestered senses to recoil and start when all that is within him does condemn itself for being there? So Mentet is now referring perhaps to the banquet scene when Macbeth was startling, seeing Banquo's ghost. And he is saying that now it is not any more surprising to us that he was startling at every point because whatever faculties he holds dear in him, even they are rebelling against Macbeth. Well, march we on to give obedience where it is truly owed. Meet we the medicine of the sickly whale 
and with him pour we in our country's purge each drop of us. So just like sometimes when there is a banquet or a party, uh, the leftover wines are actually put together in one bowl for many people to drink or a punch is prepared for many people to enjoy. Similarly, Katniss says that let us pour our bloods into the just cause and let us fight for the upheaval of Macbeth who has already usurped unjustly the throne of Duncan. For so much as it needs to dew the sovereign flower and down the weeds make we our march towards Burnham. So Lennox said that don't worry, all of our bloods won't be needed. So we shall spill the blood as much as it is needed. So we shall spill blood in moderation. Now we come to scene 3 which is in a room in the castle. Enter Macbeth, doctor and attendants. Bring me no more reports, let them fly all. Tin Burnham would remove to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. What's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? The spirits that know all mortal, mortal consequence have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth, no man that's born of woman shall ever have power upon thee. Then fly false things and mingle with the English epicures. The mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. So Macbeth is clinging on to the prophecy made by the witches and he says that no matter, even if his stains leave him, even if his stains flee, Macbeth still says that it does not matter and he will still be victorious because until Burnham would come to dancing in, Macbeth does not need to worry. Moreover, he knows that Malcolm was naturally born out of a woman, that is, he had a natural birth, he had a normal delivery. So, he does not know that Macduff had a caesarean delivery and his mother died in the process. So, he says that I need not fear Malcolm, but he has not taken into consideration Macduff. Enter a servant. The devil damn thee black, thou cream faced bloom. What gottest thou? Where gottest thou that goose to? So now Macbeth is chastising the servant for having a pale look out of fear. And he is asking that why do you have such a pale look? There is 10,000. Geese villain? So now Macbeth is comparing his enemies to geese. He is brave Macbeth still. Noble no more, but he is still a fighter. And now Macbeth asks him that what have come against him? Human beings or geese? Because nothing matters to him anymore. He can slaughter them equally. Soldiers, sir, go prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily livered boy. Lily livered means lilies of the color of uh, is of the white color. And lily livered means pale hearted. Basically, according to medieval physiology, the physiology which concerned with the four humors, it kind of suggested that the liver, not the heart, is the root of all the blood flow in our body. And it is the blood which carries forth the emotions by carrying forth the humors, the four kinds of humors. So by suggesting that lily livered, he is suggesting that you are weak willed or weak hearted. So he says that go and prick yourself with needles so that you become a little bit blushed and do not look so flushed in the process. Those linen cheeks of thine are counsellors to fear. What soldiers way face the English force so please you? Take thy face hence, exit servant, and look then he calls for his favorite sidekick whose name is Satan. It is reminiscent of Satan himself. Satan, I am sick at heart when I behold. Satan, I say, this push will cheer me ever or dissent me now. I have lived long enough. My way of life is fallen into the seer, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age as honor, love, obedience, troop of friends, I must not look to have. But in their steed curses, not loud, but deep mouth honor, breath, 
which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not say to him. So now Macbeth realizes that he has lived a wayward life and he realizes that he has thrown his life into the drains, into the gutter. And now that he, the leaf of his life has turned yellow with age, he realizes that he has not gathered many friends. And those who kind of follow him out of obedience are there just because of their obedience to the throne and not to himself. Therefore, he realizes that he has not gathered any honor. Those who honor him only honor him from their mouth and not from their hearts. And therefore, he says that I do not care anymore. He has lost all hope. Enter Satan. What is your gracious pleasure? What news more? All is confirmed, my lord, which was reported. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me my armor. It is not needed. I'll put it on, send it out more horses, skirt the country round, hang those that talk of fear. Give me mine armor. So Macbeth is once again ready to don up the role of the ruler, the leader, the fighter. But he does not realize that he has lost the right to fight anymore. The divine right, the just right fighting is no longer his. And then he looks to the doctor and says, How does your patient doctor? Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick coming fancies that keep her from her rest. So the doctor says that her ailment is not physical, my lord, but it is psychological. Cure her of that. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the ridden troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuff stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. Macbeth as if speaks out himself as well because he too is suffering from the same ailment. Is that Macbeth does not show and Lady Macbeth cannot hide anymore. But you know, I believe that if Act 5, Scene 3 had happened earlier, Lady Macbeth wouldn't have died because she would have understood that her husband does care about her. It is the miscommunication rather than any real problem which aggravates her suicide. Therein the patient must minister to himself and the doctor kind of realizes that Macbeth is also suffering from the same pain and therefore he says that must minister to himself and not to herself. Throw physic to the dogs, I'll none of it. Come, put my armor on. So now he will be talking to the doctor and to Satan uh, simultaneously and therefore follow the dashes. Whenever there is a dash, after that he will be changing the person spoken to. So come, put my armor on, give me my stuff. So he's talking to Satan. Satan, send out. So send out the more horses who are going to make a survey of the country. Doctor, the things fly from me. And then once again he talks to Satan. Come sir, dispatch. Go on now, dispatch the horses. If thou couldst, doctor, cast the water of my land and find the disease. And purge it to a sound and pristine health. I would applaud thee to the very echo that should applaud again. Pull it off, I say. What rhubarb, syme, or what purgative drug would scar these English hands? Here is thou of them. So now Macbeth involves the doctor in the discourse of politics as well. He says that you use rhubarb, syme, and so on and so forth, so many roots. Isn't there a root for defeating the enemy? Isn't there a root for defeating death? Isn't there a root for defeating all forms of human ailment? So look, Macbeth over here is echoing Dr. Faustus because Dr. Faustus had quit medicine because there is no cure to death. And Macbeth comes to the same realization and therefore he kind of begs to the doctor. You know, there is a Buddhist story which I am reminded of. 
a lady went to Lord Buddha. She had just lost her son, a very young child. And she asked the Lord that, please, O oh Lord, give my son back to me. Now Buddha said, okay. He could not say no to such a mourning mother. So he asked the mother that bring me a pail of water from any house which has not seen death. Bring it to me by sunset and I'll give your son his life back. The woman searched from door to door, from morning to noon to the sunset, and then came back to the Lord and started wailing. And the Lord said, what happened? And the woman said, there is no single house which has not seen death. And then Lord Buddha said, then how do you expect your house to not know death? So this is the issue. You see, Macbeth now comes to the same realization. Whatever you reap, that is what you sow. I, my good Lord, your law, royal preparation makes us hear something. So the doctor knows that he must speak in a language which is appropriate. He cannot talk to the king about the rumors that he has heard. He can only tell the king whatever he is seeing. Bring it after me. I will not be afraid of death and pain till Burnham Forest comes to dance again. So Macbeth still desperately holds on to the idea that until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane, which is a physical impossibility, he will not be killed. Doctor aside, were I from Dunsinane and away went clear, profit again should hardly draw me here. So the doctor says that, yes, I came to Dunsinane for profit and profit alone. But if I could escape from Dunsinane, then no matter how much profit I gain from here, I would never return. Now we come to scene 4. A country near Dunsinane, a wood in view. The wood is Burnham Wood. Enter with drum and colours, Malcolm, Old Seward and his son, Macduff, Menteth, Katniss, Angus, Lennox, Ross and soldiers marching. Malcolm, cousins, I hope the days are near at hand, the chambers will be safe. So Malcolm says that I hope that the day is near when we shall sleep in safety. We doubt it nothing, so we do not doubt it. That wood is, the, what wood is this before us? The wood of Burnham. Let every soldier hew him down a bough and bear it before him. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our host and make discovery err in report of us. Now you know, when Aristotle talks about Amartya, as I have already spoken about Hamartya. Hamartya is an error of judgment. But the judgment, the error of judgment is by missing the mark. Now, sometimes it so happens that the hero does not take into consideration all the pros and cons of his decision because he too is human. Because Aristotle was already propagating a theory of the hero to be very, very reliable as a human being, as a real-life human being. And as real-life human beings, sometimes we make hasty decisions. Sometimes we make wrong decisions based on incomplete data. Or sometimes we make wrong decisions out of a mistaken analysis. Now, Macbeth, as a fighter, knows this much that it is a common ploy. To hide your numbers under the foliage or rocks or something like that. So this camouflaging technique, this camouflaging technique is very, very well known. It was very, very well known back in that time. And Macbeth being a warrior himself should have been very, very aware of this situation. But the problem is that he is so very obsessed with the witches and their prophecies that Macbeth does not take into consideration the very basic premise that this might not be the woods moving, but rather the soldiers who have come 
under the camouflage of the woods so that nobody understands that how many soldiers are there so this completely evades macbeth's mind and he gets afraid now it shall be done we we'll learn no other but the confident tyrant keeps still in dancing and will endure our setting down before it this is main hope for where there is advantage to be gone both more and less have given him the revolt and none serve him with but constraint things whose hearts are absent to so those who serve him serve him out of a loyalty to the throne and those who have some common sense or some conscience have escaped from there so macbeth mostly alone stands to protect the castle of dunsinane let us just let our just censures attend the true event and put we on industrious soldiership so macbeth says that let us march towards there with all the disregard we have for him in our heart and let us fight and win for our cause the time approaches that will with due decision make us know what we shall have what we shall say we have and what we owe hot speculative their unsure hopes relate but certain issue strokes must arbitrate towards which advance the war so now seward says that as the time approaches for the war we must be firm in our decisions and we must not falter we must not give him any inch for protecting himself for justifying himself and we must move forward cautiously now we come to scene 5 dancing in within the castle enter with drum and colors macbeth satan and soldiers macbeth hang out the banners on the outward walls the cry is still they come our castle strength will laugh a siege to scorn here let them lie till famine and the egg eat them up were they not forced with those that should be ours we might have made them their full beard to beard and beat them backward home what is that noise so macbeth now realizes that he does not have the military power to enter into a direct battle and send the rebellious army back because many of his soldiers have revolted against him and have joined the opponent side so macbeth now takes a new strategy he says that since burnham castle since dunsin and castle is so very well fortified therefore let us stay here let us stay put and when the time comes their their supplies end they will have to return on their own but if i had my full army i would have thrusted them away from here myself we could have had a proper fight but that is not the case which is possible right now and then suddenly there is a noise from within so women are crying it is the cry of women my good lord i have almost forgot the taste of fears so macbeth has been so very engrossed with his own predilection with his own uh personal horrors that he has forgotten the taste of terrors the time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek and my fell of hair would at a dismal shriek is rouse and stir as life were in it so macbeth says if it would have happened in the past if i would have heard such a shriek then that would have made me unsettled because i had life in me back then but right now this scream this echo of fear does not stir anything in me anymore. i have supped full with horrors dialness familiar to my slaughterhouse thoughts my slaughterhouse thoughts cannot once stir me 
So no matter how murderous the thoughts that arise in me, they cannot stir me anymore. Re-enter Satan, wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. Lady Macbeth has committed suicide. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Trips in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty day. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is hurt no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So look, basically this statement, she should have died hereafter, is a very ambiguous statement. So it means two things. That is, yes, she would have died sometime, so it doesn't matter when she is dead. Or, she, it is true that man is mortal and therefore she should have died. But, she could have deferred it at least till my battle was won. There would have been a time for such a world. Basically, Macbeth says that if I was not so very burdened with the present battle, I could have at least responded to the news of her, of her death. I could have properly responded to it. But he realizes that tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, the plurality of the tomorrows creeps in this petty pace from day to day. So now, we see that every day comes, every day goes away, nothing changes, very little changes. But we see that in the long term, a lot has changed. So, till the last level of recorded time, that is the record of time, now this, uh, that is the time phase, uh, the time fixed in the decrees of the heaven and the earth for the period of life. So no matter how much time heaven has given us, all life, all time is ridden with tomorrows. And basically these tomorrows creep in this petty pace. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. And look, all the yesterdays, all the past has paved a path for fools. By fools, here Shakespeare means fowls, that is the crowds, to their dusty death. So, there must be a reference to the word dusty. Uh, dusky death, that is death at the end of the life. This is a suggestion by Tebold. Tebold was a famous uh, editor of Shakespeare. He was Pope's contemporary. And Tibold says that from the psalm, Shakespeare has taken this expression, dusty death, and he has turned it into dusty death. And again, there is the reference to dust to dust, that uh, book of common prayers, from ashes to ashes, from dust to dust. That reference is there as well. Uh, Lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. Now, this is a very interesting way for Shakespeare to incorporate a stage direction in the scope of the acting. Imagine my two hands. Now, these are the two sides of the stage. The audience is at the front and the wings are at the back. Now, on both sides of the stage, there were massive candles during the Elizabethan period, which used to burn and light up the space. 
Now this is Act Five, Scene Five. So by now the candles are mostly burnt out. So when the character who is playing Macbeth, when he will walk towards one corner of the stage, his shadow will be larger than his body. And he is looking at a candle. He is looking down, and there is a the remnant of a candle burning. And he would say to it, "Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow." So look at the theatrics of Shakespeare's dialogues as well. This is a very brilliant way of putting it. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. So when the characters leave the stage, the play ends, but the drama still continues. Life still continues. But the poor player is not heard after he leaves the stage. It is a tale told by an idiot. Love sound and feeling, signifying nothing. So at the act five, scene five of his age, of his life, Macbeth has realized that all he has amounted to is nothing. Enter a messenger. Thou camest to use thy tongue, thy story quickly. So you came to tell me something. Go on ahead, tell me quickly. Gracious, my lord, I should report that which I saw, but know not how to do it. So he is afraid that how to tell Macbeth of what he has seen. Well, say, sir, as I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham, and anon methought the wood began to move. Already the prophecy has come into action, and Macbeth says, "Liar and slave, let me endure your wrath." If it be not so, within this three mile, may you see it coming. I say a moving grove. So if I am wrong, punish me however you please. But if you look at three miles away from here, you will see that a grove is moving. If thou speakest false, upon the next tree shalt thou hang alive till famine cling thee. If thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou dost for me as much. So if you are lying, I'll hang you on the next tree, and you will die out of hunger. So until you die out of hunger, I won't bring you down. But if what you are telling is the truth, then I don't care even if you do the same to me. I pull in resolution. And begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane, and now a wood comes to Dunsinane. Arm, arm, and out! So now he realizes that the devil equivocates, and now he says that they told me that Burnham would come would come to Dunsinane, and I thought that this was a massive joke, but it actually happened. So now arm, arm, and out. So get yourself armed and go to fight. If this which he avouches does appear, there is not flying hens, not tearing here. So if whatever he says is actually true, then there's no point in flying. There's no point in making delay. It's best if I meet my doom, if I meet my destiny. I grin to a weary of the sun, and wish the estate of the world when thou art done. So look once again over here in the word sun. There is a pun, S U N and S O N. So Macbeth says, "I am weary of the sun itself. That is of Malcolm, of Fleance, and of the sun, which is the giver of all life." Ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rag. At least we'll die with harness on our back. So now Macbeth wants to die, a glorious death, a proper death befitting a soldier. Act five, scene six. The same, a plain before the castle. Enter with drum and colours, Malcolm, old Seward, Macduff, etc., and their army with bows. Now near enough, your leafy screens throw down, and show like those you are. You were the uncle, 
shall with my cousin your right noble son lead our first battle what the macduff and we shall take upon what else remains to do according to our order so now Mac malcolm speaks in the royal plural and he commands old seward who is his uncle that you take your son and you go and you join the fight first macduff and i'll stay back and i'll flank them fare you well do we but find the tyrant's part tonight let us be beaten if we cannot fight so if we cannot defeat him by tonight then let us be beaten let us be defeated if we cannot fight him make all our trumpets speak give them all breath those clamorous harbingers of blood and death so now the battle begins scene seven the same another part of the plain enter macbeth they have tied me to a stake i cannot fly but bear like i must fight of fight the course so here the reference is to bear baiting which was a popular game now when there was not a theater going on when there was not a play going on they used to bear bait bear baiting was a game where a bear would be tied to a pole and hungry dogs would be thrown at it there would be a massive fight and if the dogs could defeat the bear they would eat it up and if the bear won then the bear was set for another round maybe some other day and thus the bear was killed eventually so he's saying that like the bear of the bear baiting round now since i am cornered i'll have to fight no matter what the cost what see that was not born of woman such a one am i to fear or man so if somebody does not come to me who was not born of a woman that is who was not naturally born then i do not need to fear that person and enters young seward what is thy name thou'll be afraid to hear it Macbeth still has his attitude up. No, though thou callest thyself a hotter name than any is in hell. So no matter, even if you take the name which is more sinful than any name in hell, I'll not back out. My name's Macbeth. The devil himself could not pronounce a title more hateful to my ear. And look, Macbeth says, no, no more fearful. So while young Seward claims that he hates Macbeth, Macbeth claims that young Seward is afraid of him. Thou liest, thou tyrant! With my sword I'll prove the lie you speak. Of. They fight, and young Seward is slain. Thou wast born of woman, but swords I smile at, weapons love to scorn, brandished by man that's of a woman. So Macbeth says, "I laugh and scorn at you because you are a woman born. I have played with swords all my life, so I am not afraid of swords either." Aram enters Macbeth. That way the noise is tyrant. Show thy face. If thou be slain, and with no stroke of mine, my wife and child's ghost will haunt me still. I cannot strike at wretched kerns. Whose arms are hired to bear their staves, either you, Macbeth, or else my sword with an unbattered edge, I sheath again unbeaded. There thou shouldst be. By this great clatter, one of the greatest note seems bruited. Let me find him, fortune, and more I beg not. So Macbeth says that if it is not I who kills Macbeth. Then the ghosts of my wife and my child would haunt me, and if I find him, it's either him or my sword that will be standing. Enter Malcolm and Old Seward. This way, my lord, the castles gently rendered. The tyrants' people on both sides to fight. The noble things to bravely endure. The day almost itself professes yours, and the little is to do. We have met with foes that strike beside us. Enter sir, the castle. So the castle is falling apart, and all the warriors are fighting beautifully. So now, Malcolm says that now Seward says that we should enter the castle. We should infiltrate the castle because they have pushed the army of Macbeth back. 
Senate, another part of the field, Lentil Macbeth. Why should I play the Roman fool and die on my own sword while I see lives that the gashes do better upon them? The Roman fool is refer a reference to Cato, Brutus, Antony, the Roman Stoics, who would often fall upon the sword to take their own life. So he says that when my sword can gash the wounds of others, then why should I wound myself or kill myself? Why should I commit suicide? But Macbeth too was woman born, he cannot commit suicide. Re-enter Macduff, turn, hellhound, turn. Of all men else I have avoided thee, but get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. So now Macbeth cannot face Macduff because he knows that he has done. He has committed a grave mistake by killing Macduff's wife and his child. And also the prophecy suggested, beware of Macduff. I have no words, my voice is in my sword, thou bloodier villain, than terms can give thee out. So you are a villain more bloody than any word can convey, and my voice is in my sword. So I would rather talk with my sword than with my voice. They fight. Thou losest labor as easy mayst thou in the entrenchant air, with thy keen sword in press. As make me bleed, let all let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charmed light, which must not yield to one of woman born. So Macbeth says that you are trying to suppress air with your swords, as if you are trying to fight with air with your sword. You are trying to wound the air with your sword. You cannot wound me with that sword because you are woman born. So nobody who is not born out of a woman cannot kill me. They spared thy charm and let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee Macbeth was from his mother's womb one time buried. So Macbeth was not woman born, but he was ripped from his mother's womb one time buried. That is, he was a Caesarian baby. Accursed be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. And these juggling fiends no more believe that falter with us in a double sense, that keep the word of promise in our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight with you. So now Macbeth is afraid and he is faltering in his battle because he knows that his doom is near. And he now curses the witches because they have tricked him into believing that he was invincible. Then yield the card and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have the, as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole and under it, and under it, here may you see the titan. So now Macduff says that and then I'll hang you on a pole, paint you, and write a message that here you might see the titan, Macbeth. I will not yield. To kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rebel's curse. The one of wood become to Dunsinane and thou oppose, being of no woman born. Yet I will try the last. Before my body I throw my warlike shield. Lay on Macduff and damned be him that first prize old enough. So now Macduff has prepared himself with his shield and his sword. So he's playing defensive and he's saying that let us fight and let him be damned who says hold enough. Excellent fighting allowance, re-enter fighting and Macbeth is dying. So Macbeth is killed. Scene 9 within the castle. Retreat flourish enter with drums and colours. Malcolm and old Seward, Ross, Thins and soldiers. Malcolm, I would the friends we miss were safe arrived. So I bet the friends that we have missed in the battle or missed over here have returned safely. Some must go off and yet by these I see so great a day as this is cheaply bought. So we have rather won very successfully at the cost of losing very few soldiers. Macduff is missing and your noble son. Your son, my lord, has paid a soldier's debt. He only lived but till he was a man. The witch no sooner had his powers confirmed. In the unshrinking station where he fought, 
but like a man he died then he is dead so now ross tells you what that your son has died valiantly like a soldier should it is a soldier's code of honor to die in battle to die in service similarly his son has died i and brought up the field your cause of sorrow must not be measured by his worth for then it had no end so please do not sorrow over him because then there will be no end of sorrow your son has done his duty and he has fallen in the line of duty so celebrate that had he is hurt before so was he stabbed on the front or from the back i on the front why then god soldier be he Had I as many sons as I have heirs, I would not wish them to a fairer death. And so his nail is mold; he is worth more sorrow, and that I'll spend for him. So he says, Old Seward says that since he has received a blow on the front, that means he has done, he has died an honest death, and that is more than what I can think for. If I had as many sons as I have hair on my head, I would have. asked i could not have asked any more than them receiving a death of honor he is worth no more they say he parted well and paid his score and so god be with him here comes newer comfort so macduff is coming and he says old seward says that he has died a noble death and that is all his due so he has earned his respect you do not worry about him We enter Macduff with Macbeth's head. Hail, King! For so thou art. Behold, where stands the usurper's cursed head? The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy kingdom's pearl, that speak my salutations in their minds, whose voices I desire aloud with mine. Hail, King of Scotland! So he says that now we are free, as Macbeth is dead, and the rightful King of Scotland has been re-established. Has been re-thrown. There has been a restoration. So hail, King of Scotland! And everybody says, "Hail, King of Scotland!" We shall not spend a large excess of time before we reckon with your loyal loves, with your several loves, and make us even with you. So basically, the legitimacy of kingship returns, and this is the justification or the safe running of the system that we are seeing. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honour named. Earls were primarily of English descent, but now, from now, Scotland, the Scottish thanes shall be called earls as well. What's more to do, which would be planted newly with time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad, that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing forth the cruel ministers of. This dead butcher and this fiend-like queen, who has just thought by self and violent hands took her life. So now he will call back everybody who tried to escape from Macbeth's wrath and Lady Macbeth's wrath. But now both of them are dead. But look, Malcolm calls Macbeth a dead butcher and his wife a fiend-like queen. This and what needful else? That call upon us by the grace of grace, we will perform in measure, time, and place. So thanks to you all once, and to each whom we invite to see us crowned at home. So finally, he says that whatever else is to be done shall be done. Thank you all, and with time we shall take measure, and we shall restore this place. The time, space, and measure. The time, place, and measure. These are the three dimensions on which Malcolm needs to work now, and he invites everybody to visit him at his coronation at Scone. And with this, our wonderful journey of Macbeth has come to an end. So I would ask you to read the text on your own and ask me if there are any questions. and maybe we can have more discussions on macbeth so this was a very intriguing text for me and i am so very glad that we had a very thorough discussion so have a good day and let's meet again sometime with something else so have a good day thank you
Thank you so much.